major aspect is that I, I'm trying to look at this from like product management plus, you know, technology and business perspective, you know, plus this epi knowledge. It's certainly important and relevant, but I think we would actually have to launch some kind of like a survey or uh, I don't know, some, some more or less kind of, you know, focused uh, discussion with, 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 you know, more, more a broad group of people in, in epi. 100%. And yeah, I apologize that I refer to you as epidemiologist expert. No, that, that's fine. I, I just, you know, it, it's not exactly, it, it might just... Honestly, uh, like I had no clue what epidemiology was just a week ago, just week, <laughs> to be 100% honest. So I, my idea is, look, if you want to find out what's epidemiology, you just open Wikipedia and read, you know, the article. And it's, by the way, it's a beautiful article about epidemiology. You, you can learn a lot. But I was trying to kind of like give you an impression and sort of like insight feeling what is it like to be in epi and what kind of issues these people are actually facing uh, as, as a part of this like you know system and agenda and I think you know there is interesting angle that um, John has touched as well like there is obviously some group of very advanced epidemiologists like who work in on very advanced projects uh, you know and uh, if if they are the consumer of this product, that's one thing. If we are talking about epidemiologists all around the world, you know, globally speaking, in all their forms and shapes, that's a totally different story because there is multiple flavors. I'm not even talking about like, the, uh, let's say, um, their therapeutic areas or specializations. Even even the idea that all the epi people around the world have good skills in um, statistics and uh, especially ML. I don't think that's exactly, you know, reflecting the reality because yes, yeah, some of them do have, but the majority does not have the great skills in uh, data science, data analysis. And, you know, because if, if you look at all those institutions where they work, uh, yeah, only a small proportion of them actually have advanced skills, I should say. And that's just my, you know, that's my observations from uh, Eastern Europe, from Asian countries, uh, from uh, even from the U.S. I was, you know, working at New York State uh, uh, Department of Health. I mean, I was an intern out there for a while. So um, I don't think like this is even big idea for those people to have these great skills. <laughs> it just it's very institutionalized process which they they are performing. That's why. I don't want to talk about you know, these philosophical things anymore. Uh, my question is, you know, uh, in this perspective, and it's a question to you, John. So uh, who do you think is going to be the target audience of, of this product that, you know, you, we are starting to shape up now, the vision of the product vision? Which, which exact subgroup of this epi people, uh, even let's say beyond COVID-19? So I think... <clears throat> In my mind, we should be thinking within the context of COVID-19, um, and thus it's you know specifically people within infectious disease epidemiology. Okay. Uh, and my understanding there is that yes, there are some more junior, or less sophisticated people there, um, but that they usually you know uh, end up deferring to more of the people who are the model builders or the study builders, um, and you know. Uh, use the methodologies that those people have um, and, you know, apply it to their own population that they're trying to serve, right? Um, and so the target really is uh, the people who are building these models, right? Um, building these models, building, uh, you know, doing the actual surveillance, um, like, protocol design. Um, the people who are uh, actually designing, like, clinical trials and trying to figure out how to allocate resources and things like that, right? Like, for a person who's more a on the ground epidemiologist who's maybe uh, actually like implementing a survey or a surveillance tool, um, I don't think that there's very much that we can do that you know uh, would replace the information that they get from uh, you know the rest of the epidemiology community. Yeah, that 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 sounds you know very. Uh... Uh, kind of like realistic in terms of yeah the surveillance and uh, the actual interventions. Uh, that's slightly different uh, thing, but um, I think we should still try to kind of you know a little bit narrow down uh, our target group of these users. 
you know, just like, I don't want to guys overwhelm you with all this like generic ideas, but uh, any product, in my opinion, you know, should start with, with the question why we are doing it. Like, what's, what's the point? Which problem are we solving? And then we can look at what should be done. And the third step is how we do it. And then we summarize this whole agenda and we actually can build something. So uh, just, just a question for, for both of you guys. Do you have an experience of building products for medical uh, professionals or researchers? Yeah, I'm just, you know, just curious, trying to find out what's the... I have some. Okay. Because I, I, I just, you know, wanted to uh, emphasize that this, in my opinion, these two groups, uh, uh, and I, I have only experience of building products for medical professionals, not, yeah, not even for the researchers, but I think they are more or less, uh, you know, in relevant, sort of relevant fields. And I, I think that these are extremely difficult groups to build products for, <laughs> you know, medical professionals and uh, especially researchers. Now we're getting into some even, I think even more sophisticated type of, uh, you know, user cases and scenarios and whatnot. So, uh, you know, in, let's in start my to- head, uh, In my head, sorry to interrupt you, like we should like immediately define the, the types of data and that's basically what would define the why because I don't think we're going to build a product that will work with uh, types of data that will require HIPAA compliance, for example. Like, I don't think that's possible within this scope uh, of work, at least for right now. And like that immediately cuts off all the, you know, a subset of whys that these people would be looking for, right? Uh, are you following uh, my train of thought? Yeah. Um... I would go further than that and say uh, that uh, going back to the like spectrum between the like really advanced research people and you know uh, having the domain knowledge uh, necessary to actually help them um, and uh, the idea that you might be able to help people who are less advanced. Um, I think uh, we need to think about this in terms of a data product, right? This is not a uh, tool necessarily so much as it is a data product that includes tools and so what we're trying to do is take unstructured data and turn it into something that can be used by someone in some useful way and so that kind of balance actually inverts where you know taking unstructured data and structuring it to the point where it's understandable to someone who doesn't have sophistication um, requires like really, really, really complex processing, right? Um, whereas taking structured data and providing some sort of structure so that a human can then, uh, you know, a human in the loop is able to then do their job better um, is actually a smaller challenge. Yeah, like doing, you know, regression or clustering on some structured data that is already defined. Well, not even that. Um, you know, it's it's... Uh, up to the researcher how they want to take the outputs that we have um, and use them. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the, like the difference of the fact that we're dealing with highly unstructured, uh, non-standardized, non-normalized data versus having, you know, perfectly structured HIPAA data set about, I don't know, like Biogen, uh, like blood, blood sample data, for example. I will, I will tell you that uh, those are not at all perfectly structured either. Um, <laughs> there are plenty of companies that work on uh, you know, trying to structure some of that data. Um, okay. Tetra Science, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it is certainly the case that you know, with textual data, um, there is less structure, even less structure than some of those formats. Um, and so going from extremely unstructured to extremely structured, um, you know, structuring it further and uh, reducing the dimensionality and uh, uh, making it so that it's understandable. Um, the further you go down to the, the pipeline from like giant data set to single number, um, the harder it becomes, right? Um, yeah, and it's actually kind of like increasing dimensionality, but in, in, a, in a different way, because essentially like Core 19 is just like, well, like five or whatever columns at the very beginning. And then you're increasing dimensionality, which 
kind of reduces that uncertainty and produces at least some information like UMLS columns that we added or named entity recognition columns and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think of dimensionality a little bit differently where unstructured data like text data has extremely high dimensionality. It's just not the case that you've actually represented it in a high dimensional space. So yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay, it's getting All right, like, that was a little abstract search. <laughs> I mean, that, that's look, uh, that's fine. I, I get it. I mean, uh, uh, the uh, concept that you are using, guys. I mean, it, it's very, it's very uh, complex, and I mean, it's respectful. I, I respect what you said because I mean, it means that you guys are really uh, big professionals in what you do. Uh, we just still need to kind of like you know narrow this down to some more simplistic user cases and whatnot. So and be able to produce some kind of like a product. I guess that that's that's just like my way of thinking because I don't want even to touch. If, if you notice, I don't even try to touch any complexities myself because, you know, there is enough of that. And uh, by the way, when you when you mentioned like uh, clinical trials and health economics and all that, um, that's even, I mean, that's, that's another huge dimension, which I'm not sure if, you know, we want to add right now to this because um, that's a highly regulated sort of, you know, type of data and, and research. It's kind of a little bit different from uh, epidemiology research, I would say, because a lot of epi uh, research is done on either open uh, source data or it's, let's say, more or less open for certain research groups who participate in that, uh, uh, in, in those interventions and they can access data so they can build up some research products eventually. And with all the clinical trials and um, health economic studies, that that's, you know, classified, I would say, you know, sort of, you know, HIPAA compliance and all that. And not just that, it, it's a proprietary data, which will probably never be uh, easily accessible to, uh, you know, to us, unless some companies now, I, I heard about Biogen, you know, they, they open up certain uh, data banks, but, you yeah, know, that's, uh, that's... If I can just cut you off there, because I have to go in uh, seven minutes, so... Uh, sure just like cutting the chase a little bit. Uh, I agree with you entirely that we can't access some of these data sets. Um, but what we can do is take the open data sets and make them useful to the people who are doing things with these other closed data sets, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, if we think about a concrete user story, essentially the user story is I'm a researcher um, in epidemiology and I want to do literature review. And I want to, instead of having to search for 600 different papers, um, in order to find out all the relevant information that I uh, need in order to make my decisions about what I'm going to do next. I want to have a tool that will give me, you know, 30 or 10 papers that I need to read um, in order to do my job. Um, so there are a lot of sub-user stories within that, you know, if you're specifically uh, focused on transmission or if you're specifically focused on vaccination, um, there's different uh, data that you would need in order to make the assessment of what those 10 papers you need to read are. Um, but essentially what we're trying to build uh, is a product that allows someone to, uh, instead of having to uh, search through 600 papers, um, be able to contextualize the broad air, like broad space of literature and also uh, focus on, uh, you know, just the papers that seem like they're most relevant. That's exactly what we discussed yesterday with uh, the broader group of people. Uh, yeah, uh, the literature review tool. Uh, that's uh, by the way, I, I figured that there is one hurdle in that perspective because uh, what are we going to do with those papers which are not, uh, you know, free to access? Actually, like there is a tension. Not sure if you guys followed that AI tool call that we had. But basically, even people or even publishers that already shared those uh, data sets, they're not willing to extend that to the fact like uh, that they are not willing to produce PDFs of those uh, scientific papers. The CORD-19 is the only way they uh, allow that data to, to be shared publicly. So um, they're, they're constantly trying to extend the data set, and it's a real struggle. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, just... Just one last comment to you guys, and that's just something that might, you know, fuel your uh, your your vision. Uh, so, again, as an epidemiologist with certain certain limited uh, ex experience, not the biggest in the world, but I can I can tell I can tell you that uh, what is the point where an epidemiologist starts to do some research? It doesn't happen because he is just interested in COVID nineteen or HIV or something like that. 
it's usually because he or she has certain data already. Some data set that he was a part of the research project and that he belongs to, uh, or you know, he has to produce some paper for some reason and you know, he has access to the data, right? That's, that's when it starts. In many, many, I'm not saying it in not all cases, but in many cases, that's like one of the user cases. So, uh, and, and his or her data is defining what could be and what potentially can be done. It's very rare that epidemiologists would be just like sitting you know, in the morning drinking his coffee and be like, hey, why don't I in invent something you know, new, com uh, absolutely you know, fabulous research in this or that. It's usually very related to what they are doing in their work within their projects and within their institutions. So we have to be mindful that all, you know, all this kind of like real world things exist. And how do we actually, that's why I'm trying to kind of like, let's define that one or two um, or three personas, like who are our core, uh, you know, kind of like focus uh, uh, potential users or whatnot, and, uh, and then maybe focus on them, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, I think it 100% makes sense. We're just not able to define those you know, within the, you know, our experience. Yep. I think we can spend some t more time. Uh, John, we'll have to go in three minutes, but I have extra 30 minutes. We can try to to nail that piece based on your experience. Because no, I'm I mean, clueless. It doesn't even mean that we have to nail it now. I'm just saying that we should try to, you know, get on the same page in terms of, yeah, this this should be done. At least some structure. Day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just my thoughts coming into this, uh, you know, trying to make sure that I give as much context to you guys before I leave. Um, so I agree that most, you know, effective epidemiologists are not the armchair epidemiologists who are like, you know, essentially philosophers thinking about, oh, is there some set of problems that I'm interested in? Um, but, you know, it's often the case that they're going to be tasked with something by their institution, or they're going to notice that, you know, uh, I have this data set, and there seems to be this gap in the literature, therefore, uh, you know, I'm going to start doing things like, things like this. Like to, to, um, to give you a specific example, right now there is this concept of oxygen deficiency as being like COVID-19 factor, and I'm sure there are plenty of those that are looking for this. Yeah, uh, so again, just trying to get through things because I have to go. Um, uh, I would say that uh, it is still the case that most of those people need some additional, uh, you know, parameters, information um, in yep. order to conduct their study. So those are the types of people that I actually want to uh, go after is Great. how do we Great. take the data set um, that you already have and the information that you already have and give you a quick way of accessing information um, that you don't already have or are like unsure about um, and make it a educated choice as to how you actually conduct this model, um, modeling exercise or whatever it is that you're doing based on this whole set of all the inputs that you have. Um, and oh, thank you so much. That's, that's fabulous. That's exactly what I was thinking as well. So, I mean, I'm happy that we are on the same page. Uh, that's for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. And beyond that, I think that there is a second use case, which is uh, people who are actually trying to ident identify, is there a place where uh, research doesn't currently agree or as compared to, you know, research that was already done on MERS or SARS-1 um, that, uh, COVID hasn't had that comparable research done yet. And so if we can contextualize where there's gaps in information or conflicting information, that's another uh, useful use case. Fantastic. I agree. That's another thing absolutely applicable. Yeah. All right. Um, I have to run. So uh, definitely looking forward to seeing whatever you guys uh, talk about for the next half hour or so. But, um, <laughs> All right. Sounds good, man. Thank you. Ping right. me if you need anything else so I can at least respond on Slack. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, John. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Okay. So I, I think we're on the same page. Again, that's a strong assumption based on our diverse <laughs> uh, range of experience and uh, understanding of this topic. Um, I agree that we shouldn't get into like technicalities and like super complex things at this point. Um, what I'm missing to be able to create user stories because I've done these like probably more than 300 times, like at least. And the, the core piece that is always the, the driver behind that is the actual extraction from the expert, the expert. 
and the understanding of the entire uh, supply chain of business uh, processes. And, you know, it typically starts even before the actual product in terms of the external factors that produce a need for this business process. And it ends with the actual applicability of the results of the product. So that's well, how, how I typically approach the, the user stories building. Arthur, that's great. And, you know, you were lucky with your previous experience because this is different. I mean, uh, I'm going to give an example. Like I was working with, let's say, this medical application, uh, you know, uh, product, right? And I was working with uh, mental health providers as, as the users, one of the users, not the only one, but one type of the users. There, only, there was also PCP providers and, and, and uh, patients. So it's medical application, right? So in this case- I, I also worked on telemedicine product uh, marketplace for uh, behavioral therapists. Oh, you see, so you understand it. But at least, you know, in that, in that case, we at least have like pretty much at least somehow defined, as you say, scenarios and supply chain details. Mm -hmm. In this case, we do not have the structured supply chain uh, process and the use cases. Because like I said, all this epidemiology research, it, it's quite diverse. <laughs> you know, it can be, there is no one rule or one book how it is done from point A to some results. Like it always emerges as a part of certain, you know, bigger projects, bigger, you know, process. So, and I think uh, what John has mentioned that, you know, we can focus on th those two types of researchers, like you know, researcher one, researcher B. The one is the guy who already has some data. That's very good point. I like that because it's very common yep. point when the researcher starts thinking, hey, I got to open PubMed and start typing something and find whatever I have on this topic and, you know, find out what has been done on this, uh, you know, in this field, what kind of techniques those people used, you know, what kind of uh, methodologies they applied. Can I actually do that with my data or not? Because, you know, I, I might have some different type of data. And the second type, researcher B, is going to be the guy who uh, maybe has some more resources and he thinks, you know, bigger. He actually thinks, okay, uh, I have this agenda. I want to look at this research, you know, lands landscape, identify what is missing out there. And maybe I can launch some uh, intervention with my research institution, collect the data and produce the research. So, or, you know, in, in many cases, actually what they should be doing before any intervention is done, like any surveillance or epidemiology interventions, they, they should check, of course, uh, what are the gaps that could be filled, you know, before they even introduce certain things. So that's like, you know, an, another type of uh, the research uh, person. But again, like it's still quite broad, like I said, because, you know, even, even with the simple uh, user cases, users like, let's say, behavioral health professionals, it was still quite hard to identify all the, you know, issues that yep. we have to take into account to make sure that they, they're using this product and it's beneficial for them, you know? And it so, always takes a form of understanding the incoming needs. Like, it's, it's not necessarily well-defined, like, singular uh, channel that, that defines the need. It's the diverse background of, you know, if taking the um, behavioral therapy, there might be, like, couples therapy. There might be, you know, addiction issues. There might be, you know, different things that differ not only by the ICD, whatever code, by the actual, you know, types of therapy that should be. Applied. Oh, of course. And I mean, it, 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 like you mentioned a very good term, supply chain. That's, I think it's a beautiful term. I would hold to it because it, it brings some clarity, you know, <laughs> supply chain in terms of like the way business is structured, like how this behavioral health professional works, what is his input, what is his output? And mm -hmm. the same here, like how do we look at the researcher? Uh, how does he work? What's his... Um, you know, what, how does he operate even beyond this tool? How does he exist in this world, you know, and how Let's does do he work and, and how does he work? Uh, you know, what kind of, what, what are the attributes of his work and what are the constraints? What is the environment of his or her work? Well, I wouldn't start doing that right now. I mean, <laughs> draw it 
you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's, it's more or less like, you know, a journey, I think it's not even a picture. It's more or less like, you know, kind of like a, a story that you can tell in terms of some, uh, some narrative, but, um, but I already see a lot of things uh, that you mentioned that are very clearly defined, which is like supply. They look like clearly defined. Let's, you know, let's assume that they are more or less defined, but mm -hmm. I think there's still going to be a, of course, you know, some <laughs> always happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Direction of research, right? Like, as you mentioned, if you work in, let's say, like, I don't know, like, I'm going to be using very dumb analogies, but if you're working, like, if the last 20 years you've been researching the effects of, you know, viral diseases on, I don't know, like public transportation or, or something, that's going to be your thing. Like, you're not going to start researching the hydroxychloroquine uh, effects on, on, like, uh, I don't know, oxygen deficiency or, or things like that, right? That's one of that's one way to think about this. Of course, you know the different types of uh, you know specialities where these people are uh, working and therapeutic areas and whatnot. Um, I think also uh, what's important to understand: Are we actually talking about epidemiologists in the U.S. or globally? Because that that might be very different audience, like completely different. Even though. Uh, the epidemiology itself as a, as a science, it's more or less unified. I was studying epidemiology in Kiev, in Ukraine, and I was studying it here in the US. And I mean, uh, methodologically speaking, it's the same science. But you know, the environment is different, right? Environments, institutions that operate in that uh, dimension in Ukraine, or let, let's say in any other part of the world, in most, I mean, besides, let's say, Western Europe and Canada, uh, maybe Australia, uh, you know, they, they are quite different. Like they have different healthcare systems, different uh, departments of health, whatnot. So well, and, please uh, explain the actual, like uh, summarize the, the difference of environment in terms of how it influences the work of this epidemiologist. It's hard to do. I mean, uh, because uh, I mean, it would be some piece of work. I mean, <laughs> explain how it's different uh, let's just affect imagine everything that. from direction of research to the actual i don't know i mean obviously it affects funding it affects the actual organizational structure and relationships and depends on the the presence of the unified healthcare system or private companies and things like that yeah all that you have mentioned is applicable um but i mean let's i guess for the sake of time and for the sake of you know kind of like let's assume it's us result. only uh do we want to focus on the the us only for now i think we should honestly yeah, I because agree. if we do uh if we look at the bigger picture in that person even though you see COVID 19 is it, it's a global issue yeah. we cannot you know just kind of like focus on the us but uh just for the sake of the project, for the user cases and for the user picture, like profile, right, the personas, we probably want to focus on uh, American epidemiologists because if we look globally, uh, there is no, I mean, I can tell you so many stories and, you know, explain you all the like differences and, and whatnot, but it's going to be probably not even that well, much important. Yeah, and that's why I asked you for a quick summary. If you're not able to synthesize that, then let's focus on you. Well, that's definitely not, not, not in one minute, sorry. Yep, uh, that, that's, sort of that's the uh, input that I needed. But the thing is, yeah, if we focus on the American, uh, you know, kind of like epidemiologists, let's, we still have to then, uh, I wouldn't even start with the therapeutic area or direction of research. I would probably start, okay, what type of institution Okay. We so are environment. Environment, yes. Like where are they coming from? Institutions, uh, you know, is it uh, like a public health institution like Department of Health or is it something like, you know, Johns Hopkins University which has their own research um, environment or... Like the, we have a connection ba uh, actually with, uh, do you know Razum Ukraine? Um, yeah, there is a founder of that uh, nonprofit that works at the Rockefeller University, and she mentioned they have like 20 labs of biologists and 
epidemiologists and things like that. Yeah, and there is uh, the third thing. It might be like some some nonprofit, smaller kind of like organizations that are existing, you know, ind uh, independently from uh, big research groups. So, uh, and I, I and commercial, right? Uh, commercial. That you know, that would be something like a pharma epidemiology. I don't think we should touch that as of now. I think we should focus on public health. You know, kind of like. Um, because commercial is mostly focused on the actual therapeutics? Uh, well, I think because, like I said, because commercial probably is related to certain pharmaceutical uh, yeah, business yeah. agendas. But that's what I... Yeah. Might be a little bit different uh, type of data and different agendas, what they you know have to cover. So uh, there is a very, very kind of like vast amount of different public health um, you know, institutions and small organizations that, that are doing certain things. So um, many of them are doing certain epidemiological research. We just need to probably try to like actually narrow our scope down to, let's say we focus on the bigger research institutions for now or smaller ones or, you know. So can you describe uh, the differences in approaches to epidemiology and direction of research for these uh, four? just so I can better understand the, the landscape. I will try. I'm not sure if it's going to be exactly, you know, 100% you know, correct. As Yoda but... says, there is no try, either do or yeah. do not. <laughs> uh, so I think let's the, uh, let's say, governmental public health institutions, uh, they are responsible for um, surveillance and, and big public health um, uh, interventions at the state level or at the federal level mm -hmm. so that's something that is moving quite slowly but you know they also are responsive responsive to things like uh, COVID-19 obviously they're working on this stuff uh, and they probably have developed multiple different uh, agendas right now for, for this uh, particular issue uh, I think they are doing the biggest kind of interventions because they have a lot of resources and they have uh, you know, they, this is their work, you know, it's like, that's a state job. And by right? interventions, you also include actual policies, right? Yes, of course, policies, but, you know, uh, policies, that's, that's a tricky question, that's a tricky concept, because policies, uh, you don't mean just, the, you know, like legislation and, and the laws, right? You mean the actual... Something that precedes that... intervention. Um... Right, well, that, that's yes. the causal relationship here. Well, there are different ways to define word policy. I'm not sure which one you're using in this case. But... I have no idea what that actually means in the <laughs> context of this, but I'm just making... Yeah, let's just, let, let's stick to uh, interventions. Inter and, okay. Yeah, because policies, <laughs> that's another complication we have. So um, then we might look at like large, uh, private or even governmental uh, educational institutions like Johns Hopkins, for example, you know, that's a good example, but there are many of them. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a public health, it's not a state of, it's not like, you know, the state um, health department of, you know, whatever, uh, but it's still a very large um, institution and they, they doing certain research. They, they are working closely with, uh, with the state as well and with other uh, type of, um, you know, stakeholders so that's that's a big player i mean what's the both. like okay so on the government level obviously there the end result is intervention right that's bas basically the the output of this box like there's you know environment direction of research supply data there is something happening in this black box and for government level officials and public health departments there is an output that is very well defined. It's the actual intervention, right? Or attempt to do one. It can be both. Sometimes it's just attempts, uh, sometimes it's interventions. Yeah, you know? okay. So that part, but I you can't. You should be aware that it's extremely hard to speak about this because it, it's such, you know, there's no one book which defines yeah. the stuff, you know? And that it, is fine it, on, it at this multiple, stage. Multiple well, cases, multiple, I, I think it might even differ from state to state, you know, I mean, in the U.S. Yep. So, um, 
municipalities also matter. Obviously, right now, governments are, um, you know, kind of not good with the government and federal uh, level interventions, but, but municipalities are actually pretty good at that, at least from what I'm seeing in, in U.S. Yeah, responding to the COVID-19, yes. Yeah. Um, but and then I think he, that here is my, my question. So I get this chain, uh, causal chain for government. Uh, I don't get it for private educational institutions. What is the end result of, of this research for them? What's the point? Um, let me give you an example. I, I can't speak for all of that stuff because it's too, let's say it's too vast, uh, but uh, they usually working uh, in conjunction with other institutions and they usually you know, doing work for the state sometimes as well. State can be very much, you know, a contra uh, you know, a, an entity that's using this uh, entities as as contractors for certain, you know, agendas, certain uh, research and uh, um, epi, even interventions as well. Okay, so uh, they're kind of part of this box, right? Well, they are, but. Look, I'm not sure that this is the right structure that we are trying to build because I'm not sure there is one that will, you know, we don't want to look funny for somebody, right? And I mean, if we show this to some professionals who actually work with this, they might have very, uh, you know, uh, But you know what happens once they look at this and see the wrong answer? The internet effect happens because you know that- I, I don't think, or I, I don't think it's, the case here. Uh, we actually, we are close to defining a certain, you know, uh, kind of like deep, important details, but uh, I'm not sure that this brainstorming form is the way to do it. <laughs> you know? Because, because you, we you're afraid that we'll, we'll make the like mistake in terms of representation of what we're trying to do? Uh, I mean, I just, trying to say that this type of question that you know you are asking here uh, I don't think it's that easy to answer we can try to play with this for, for the you but know, you know what that. like this conversation the past 10 minutes gave me more understanding of the actual problem than the past two days digging through all the you know epidemiology pages and r reading articles at yeah and I think I, I my brain, by, by the time when we actually get to the point of you know uh, structuring the product vision and uh, all that stuff, user stories and uh, personas. We should we should we should get all this knowledge. Don't worry. But at the same time, I don't want you to like get to disperse your uh, your vision. Because, <coughs> of course, you know it, it, it's it's such a vast it's such it's a universe. You know, <laughs> we can look at one star. We can look at multiple stars. We can look at you know anything. And there are so the, many different things. The things that don't change, like I want to extract the things that don't change and uh, the things that stay in place with the all the other moving uh, kind of uh, objects and agents in, in this ecosystem. Because obviously the direction of research is, is gonna be different for any kind of institution. The supply data will be different. Some organizations may have proprietary data, some may work with the state level uh, supply of, of data. And again, like nonprofits may have different partnerships for data. I don't think we should focus on uncovering these things that uh, change and are variable, but I think the things that are static, which are basically the types of environment, I think we will define at least major players. Obviously there are more, yes, uh, but, but then there are very concrete um, motivations for these entities to participate in in this ecosystem for government it's interventions for private educational institutions that's um, I, I'm not sure yet like please explain I'm not sure either honestly I, I would have to research that myself you know to find out the cl okay. clear kind of like answer to this question I have a couple of assumptions but I'm not sure like if they are uh, the actual ones, uh, but we would need to define this. Yes, we would need to define what's the agenda behind all these players, and we would need to be able to uh, clearly tie that to what our product is supposed to to be doing. So, uh, you know what? Like, there there is this concept of 
you know, I'm, I'm referring it to as emergence, but in reality, whatever we will build will, will be very easily fine tuned on the like technical level to supply for different variations in this environment. But to get there, we need at least some concrete, uh, like not even visualization, but at least some form of this business process. Yep. And I think, by the way, uh, at this stage, where when we are talking now about the structure of the healthcare system and uh, all the epidemiological research, uh, that's the point when we probably should involve, you know, certain experts yeah. and not just one or two, but I mean, I'm talking about maybe 10, 15 people, uh, and maybe we should conduct a structured interviews or at least structured surveys. We could send them, you know, Google forms and let, you know, ask them to fill those. Um, cause I think who can help us create those surveys. Do you think you're capable of doing that? I can do that. I can do that. Certainly. We just need to, you know, kind of like define the Let's uh, try research, to do agenda, that, no. research agenda. And, uh, that's, uh, look, are there, uh, this is not even like, this is just the piece of this whole story, but, um, I'm glad that we finally are close to some sort of vision. Who is the user? Who is like, who are we doing this for? Because I can tell you, once we have this uh, more or less clear and defined, now we can actually start working on this. Because before, I couldn't even start doing nothing because I, I had no idea what are we doing. Because now I can check who are the competitors in this field who are doing something for this specific type of users, who are, who are trying to solve these problems we are trying to solve. Uh, we then we can Google start that, thinking. By the way. Uh, then we can start thinking, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what, uh, who are we going to ask? Who are going to be the experts to answer very specific questions to justify uh, and verify our visions, right? Um, that's, <laughs> that's a long journey. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, when you're talking about researching the competitors and what's existing there, uh, I wonder how y you you would be googling for something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this looks I, interesting. I would need to think about it, <laughs> but that's that's yeah, that's a good question. It's solvable. Uh, yeah, it's it usually takes a lot of time to do the research of the competitor uh, background landscape. Yeah, we apply computational and statistical methods to sequence data to understand viral dynamics and reconstruct patterns of epidemic growth and geographic spread. Kind of sounds like a, a piece, right? Uh, what this is this is the look. This is the big problem that everybody is facing when they're trying to build something really complex. <laughs> there, <laughs> there is no there is no such thing as it sounds like you know. This product is completely different from what we are talking about, but it's also, you know, sort of in the same field, I guess. It's epidemiology and public health, but it's not what we are doing completely. I mean, at least. Yeah, it's not 100%. But for us to understand the, the key stakeholders of this process, obviously, okay, so this bad forward, it, it looks like it's a real thing, right? Let's. You know what? I also have an idea for, for you to think uh, for the future uh, steps. Um, uh, instead of oh, trying wow. to... 213,000 followers. Instead of trying to define, you know, kind of the whole, uh, the whole possible landscape of potential institutions and users, do you think we can start a conversation with some um, institution right now? And, and partner with them at the early stage and actually do something for for some specific institution and you know run that sort of like a, a, a trial pilot, or yeah. launch it you know within some uh, so here's system. my, my uh, kind of concern was that uh, you know in a typical startup environment i would totally do that like it's it it's always the best uh, goal to start with some existing business or some existing customer and just build for that customer, right? Uh, typically, it requires a lot of time for this knowledge extraction and business process extraction. 
and it assumes that the variability of the business processes is not that um, you know diverse. Here, based on what you said, we would immediately kind of lock down to some potentially very niche use case that may not be scalable to to other um, you know same type of personas just because of how no, this I, I think works. I think it can be uh, if we if it walk this through properly it can be scalable I mean it, okay, why not? so what kind of institution uh, tell something me like, something no. like you mentioned Johns Hopkins or whoever else from the public health who reached out to you already okay uh, so and I mean some Let's try to have a call with that uh, Olya from uh, Rockefeller University. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. I mean, uh, the thing is, it's going to be challenging. I can tell you why. Uh, look, I, I'm just like sharing my first, <laughs> my feelings about this. Like, what, when, when do you start inviting researchers who are busy with their work in this project? Uh, they are going to be mad at us because this is so far very, very, you know, very unclear. What are we doing here? Yeah. People in research. It's don't annoying. Like this. People don't like this. People would not. I'm just trying to like even imagine some of my colleagues who are extremely smart people. I mean, they probably would not even be willing to talk to us because it's it's just you know it's not, <coughs> so what are we doing here and uh, what's the purpose and uh, at least now it's getting more or less closer to being clear. But yeah, so once we, uh, let, let's uh, define who we can talk to and then um, we should prep to those calls. We should like define what the agenda should be covered and uh, we should actually ask some questions not related to the product vision, but ask How they them work. What, we can, what we can do for them. Find out what, what is like their agenda, what they, what they need to be done. And then we can try to, uh, you know, kind of like sync with our efforts and, and yeah. see if it can be embedded into our work. I like this approach. Oh. So let's commit to this. I'll reach out to Rockefeller University. Uh, do you have any personal connections to any of these uh, organizations? I do, I do, I do, I do. Uh, I will probably, let's start with your connections because it's, a, you know, people already are introduced to this yeah. agenda. At least they know that you're doing this. And then the next wave <laughs> the next batch of uh, connections, I'll bring some as well, for sure. I need to think about who will be the best uh, to start with. And I think by that time, I, I'll also be able to articulate yeah. the whole thing a little bit better, you know? Yep. So, because I'm still very fresh. <laughs> In so, coronavirus yeah. years. Absorbing, yeah. absorbing fresh, all this. Uh, fresh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, that sounds great. I think we reached a lot of good points today. I think it will be also helpful for all the people, uh, you know, in the literature review channel, just to understand the train of thought sure. and the fact that, like, we have yet to define the actual product, but our vision at least makes sense and is crystallized in the in some form or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I mean, if anybody has, you know, some feedback, please share, because the thing is, we might be, you know, we, we are now discussing some stuff, but. We don't even know if we're moving in the right direction, you know, like not, we're not, wrong. Like I can tell you we're hundred <laughs> percent wrong. <laughs> so I mean maybe not exactly wrong, but who knows, right? So if, if anybody has very no, I can tell you we're wrong. That's crispy, uh, clear feedback on yeah. which direction we should be moving to, please provide that. I mean, because we can debate and uh, you know brainstorm for many hours, but we should be getting to some more or less well defined stage soon. Yeah, so. if there's anything I really, really learned in the past three weeks, it's the fact that I'm con constantly wrong. And <laughs> it's just the, the function of optimizing for acceptance of that uh, truth and, and reality. And that's it. That's, that's something that we spoke before about, you know, the whole idea of this community, which is, you know, so beautiful uh, in terms of like how this all works. We should try to kind of like, embed this in the in the vision and the mission because the I think culture. this idea that people are stepping out of their comfort zones hey I'm such a great you know um, professional in this and that but here you face a bunch of other people who don't know what you're talking about and you have to explain something to them and then you get the feedback and then you have to kind of start learning something again 
Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a new way of uh, sharing knowledge. And I, by the way, I read something what Slava was mentioning in his vision, kind of like statements that uh, he's all about like knowledge sharing and everything. That's, that's also very, uh, I finally got his point as well, by the way. So yeah. We should probably, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like we all, and uh, we created, created that channel motivation and purpose because I finally understood what was missing from all of our conversations. We all speak about the same thing just through the prism of our experience and background. And the thing that doesn't change and is the same is our motivation and purpose of our participation. And that's something that has potential to unite us and create that culture of, you know, accepting that you're wrong, accepting that there is probably someone that knows it better or, you know, that the actual better state can be achieved through, you know, hundreds of people collaborating on a document or just throwing random ideas at, at each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I can tell, I can tell my, one of my motivators is not to teach somebody, but to learn. Yep. Uh, that's even, even stronger motivation because, you know, it, it looks like in such a diverse uh, ocean of different thoughts and ideas and, and skills, you can actually catch up a lot. So, yeah. All uh, right. Good, good call. Yep, inspiring call, and let's touch base tomorrow, and hopefully yeah. I get some response from Olya. On, on yeah, please, uh, and you know, we, we, we can then prep for the call and uh, invite, you know, yep. uh, all the people and, uh, and speak. All right, sounds good, man. All right. Thanks. Bye.